Thank you. Please stand by. You will now be placed into conference. Race and economics are so highly correlated. Uh, we are racially segregated by neighborhoods. Um, some places have high rates of incarceration, while other places have very low rates of incarceration. In Cleveland and Baltimore, for example, there are neighborhoods where uh, almost one out of five adult males is behind bars on any given day. Uh, in Brooklyn, in the black neighborhoods of Brooklyn, the, incarcer the incarceration rate is 12.4 percent. In the white neighborhoods, it's 2.7 percent. In Chicago, over half of all prisoners re-enter uh, seven of Chicago's 72 neighborhoods. Over half of the prisoners go to 10 percent of the neighborhoods. Mm. And in Tallahassee, a place that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, um, and there are two neighborhoods where nearly every family, uh, every family member has a relative who has been gone to prison within the last five years. So to summarize this, the Americans, the, uh, the 600-fold uh, increase in incarceration in the United States, that's fine, you can go to the next slide, a cent increase in incarceration in the United States has been concentrated by, among black young men who live in poor neighborhoods. And in those poorest neighborhoods, it is so concentrated that in some of those neighborhoods, um, every family is affected by incarceration. Um, this is a map of crimes in Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, it, it shows the, the point we, which we've known for a long time, the crime concentrates. So this is essentially a, what the police used to do with those little pins. There's a, a blue dot every time there's a crime in, in this year. Uh, and what you see is that um, in Delray Beach, the blue dots spread along this uh, horizontal. Uh, that's actually Atlantic Avenue. It runs out to the ocean on the right-hand side. Um, there's another hot spot in, up in the northern corner. Uh, and there's a little bit of a warm spot in the southern, southwestern corner, but really crime concentrates along Atlantic Avenue and in a southern area in that brown space. That brown space that's in there uh, is a, a section of Delray Beach that is referred to as the Atlantic section of Delray Beach. It's populated by um, uh, Hispanics, Caribbeans, and blacks. Next slide, please. This is this shows the, the corollary of crimes concentrating in certain, concentrating in certain neighborhoods. Uh, 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 arrests also concentrate in those neighborhoods. This happens to be juvenile arrests. And what you see, obviously, is that there's a close correspondence between those two slides. This is a block-by-block -block juvenile arrest rate. So what you can see is in Delray Beach, where juveniles get arrested, is in the Atlantic section. And in some of these uh, uh, block areas, multi-block areas, which are housing projects, the arrest rates are extremely high. The most dense arrest rates are the dark brown uh, in that picture. Next slide, please. So this is a hard-to-see map uh, on your screen of Brooklyn, New York. It is a jail and prison admission uh, map for Brooklyn, New York, and it's blo literally block by block. The blue areas with the numbers in them are council districts. They have a quarter of a million people living in them. Uh, and uh, then each, in each of those areas, there's actually a block being mapped there. So because the screen is so saw, small, let me tell you that the brown blocks, of which there are a couple of dozen in this screen, um, have a minimum of 30 people locked up, uh, sent to prison or jail, in that, uh, sent to prison uh, in that year, and a maximum of 275 people sent to prison from that block in that year. So, you can, so there are individual blocks in Brooklyn. There's one block in Brooklyn where 275 people was, were sentenced to prison from that block in that year. This, uh, but what you can see from this is the enormous concentration. It concentrates around, uh, around um, uh, um, the, the, uh, away from the uh, wealthier white areas of, of uh, Brooklyn and concentrates in the African American uh, and, to a lesser extent, the Hispanic sections of, of, uh, of Brooklyn. Next slide, please. All right, so this is unreadable. I apologize. But let me tell you what this is. This is a list of summaries that I, uh, a list of studies I summarize in Chapter 5 of the book. Chapter 5 is, death by, is entitled Death by a Thousand Little Cuts. And these are, each of these is a study of the impact of incarceration on some other aspect, not the person who's been incarcerated. So for example, there's a whole series of the top sections, a whole series of studies of the impact of incarceration on the children of the people being incarcerated. The most recent series of studies have been done by Murray and Farrington, uh, showing uh, that uh, 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 there appears to be a causal relationship between having a parent go to prison and having later serious juvenile delinquency in the child's life. 
That is to say, sending a parent to prison isn't just predictive of getting in trouble with the law later for that child, but it is actually causing getting in trouble with the law for that child, uh, uh, later for that child. The, the second set of studies have to do with families. There's a range of studies here, um, uh, all, uh, but the most interesting, some of the most important ones uh, show that incarceration rates seem to be causing high rates of single parent, uh, high rates of um, divorces, and high rates of child poverty going on to welfare. The next section is parenting. There's a small number of studies about parenting, and the studies of parenting suggest that having a, a person go to prison uh, decreases the, the, uh, the, the strength of uh, parental identification of children with, with the parent who did not go to prison and decreases the influence of the parent on that child's behavior. There's a one impact on, uh, study in, of impact on community. Lynch and Sable, uh, other than the ones I'm about to summarize of my own work, uh, Lynch and Sable um, uh, found that uh, going, uh, having high incarceration rates in a community is associated with the undermining um, uh, collective sentiments in those community which support norms. Uh, there's two studies of, of, of the impact of incarceration on community level health measures. Very interesting. To me, one of the most important studies in, this, in these data carried out by an epidemiologist in North Carolina, uh, Jim, James Thomas, finds that incarceration rates are associated with, are, uh, uh, lead to higher rates of sexually transmitted diseases uh, and to higher rates of teenage births. I just want to say that the finding in relation to teenage births is very important because teenage births in one year predict crime rates uh, 15 years out. So what uh, Thomas has found is that neighborhoods, that, that the, there's a causal relationship between the number of people going in and out of, cycling in and out of the prison in the neighborhood and the rate of sexual transmission, sexual, sexual diseases being transmitted in that neighborhood and the rate of single parent uh, of teenage births. He speculates that the reason is that having lots of men cycling in and out of prison weakens the relationships between men and women generally in the neighborhood, reduces the incentives that the lower number of men in that neighborhood have to engage in safe sex and to engage in, in um, uh, single par uh, partner sexuality and increase the risk of, uh, of um, teenage mo uh, girls uh, uh, getting involved in sexual relationships with men leading to, to pregnancy. The economic studies are well known. These are studies that show that going to prison reduces economic activity and that in concentrations in neighborhoods uh, that people who go to prison earn less money, uh, are less likely to be employed after prison, after, short, after the first six months after leaving prison, uh, and, uh, and are less likely, are more likely to be on welfare, and on and on and on. And uh, Bruce, the last item in here, Bruce Western, shows that, um, that um, uh, inequal uh, uh, economic inequality in the United States is partially produced by incarceration rates in the United States. And the last set of studies has to do with politics from the very famous study showing that George Bush was elected uh, on the basis of a vote in Florida that excluded a half a million uh, of people from uh, the voting voting rolls of which, um, uh, you know, if, if they had voted, uh, he would not have been elected because he won that election by 500 votes. But also some studies by uh, uh, Bob Crutchfield in Portland, Oregon, showing that uh, 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 youths who live in, in neighborhoods where there are high rates of incarceration, people going in and out of the prison system, have less, less confidence in the state, have less belief in the uh, legitimacy of the law, and are less likely to be interested in obeying the law. Next slide, please. So this is the model, then, of the impact of concentrated, incarcerate, uh, concentrated incarceration on, on crime. Um, I won't talk about this model a lot except to summarize it quickly to say that, in, that through the, in the upper box deterrence, incarceration is expected to have impact on crime by uh, suggesting to people who live in neighborhoods that if you break the law, you, bad things are going to happen to, to you, so you probably ought not to break the law. Every other box in here is, a, is an impact on, on crime in the, net, in the exact opposite way, Increasing, decreasing the economic uh, structure, uh, damaging family stability, um, uh, decreasing personal capacity, um, uh, de uh, destabilizing pro-social beliefs, and, um, and, and in a, as a direct effect, increasing the number of people re-entering through prison. Uh, uh, leading to more people who are at risk of getting involved in crime, being involved in the, uh, in, in the community. So there's, uh, so from this box, you would expect that there would be, be a small uh, uh, de deterrence effect that, that could be well outweighed by all the other effects 
combined in high incarceration neighborhoods. Next slide, next slide, please. This is a map of crime and and, uh, and uh, uh, release rates in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, and this is a map of Tallahassee, a city of about a quarter of a million. Uh, what you can see is the crime rate. Uh, this doesn't really show you, but it shows that that people were released from uh, prison to all over Tallahassee, but some places almost nobody came from prison, and other places a lot of people came from prison, and it shows that crime rates also tend to center in the center of the city. Next slide, please. Um, so what we did in Tallahassee was to gather data on uh, incarceration rates in 1996, uh, crime rates in 1997, crime rates in 1996, and we wanted to look at the impact of incarceration rates in one year on crime rates in the following year, controlling for crime rates in, the pre in that first year and uh, other measures of, uh, of a social disorganization, poverty, um, mobility, and uh, uh, racial heterogeneity in those neighborhoods. So this is a graph of those effects. It's a little bit hard to read, so let me explain it. Um, um, the, the solid line is shows that what the relationship was between crime rates in one year, uh, incarceration rates in one year, and crime rates in the next year, as incarceration rates went up. So what you see is as incarceration go, rates go up, crime rates decline to a certain point. Now, after a certain point, as the number of people being removed from that neighborhood, being sent to the prison system, uh, increases, um, uh, incarceration rates start to go up very rapidly. Um, so that what you see is that in high incarceration rate neighborhoods, the, the incarceration rate is caught, the higher, the uh, higher the incarceration rate, the higher the crime rate in those neighborhoods. Uh, what makes this graph interesting is that if you were to also graph re the impact of reentry on crime, you would have a solid line, not curved, going across about the point, the, about the 30 uh, in this figure, so that you would see that the impact of incarceration, of reentry on crime is linear. That is, that every, each new person coming into the, into the neighborhood, uh, uh, the uh, next year's crime rates go up. But the impact of incarceration rates is curvilinear. That is, for the, for, uh, as you remove a few people, you tend to make the neighborhoods a little bit safer. But as you remove more people, the, the neighborhoods become less safe in the following year. And the, higher, the more people you remove, the stronger that relationship is to the point that where lots of people are being removed, you have very strong predictions of crime rates in the following year. To summarize this figure, then you would say that, uh, that high incarceration rates in a neighborhood are predictive of higher crime rates in the following year in that neighborhood, controlling for factors and uh, other factors that relate to crime. This is a map of, um, of uh, releases from the Florida State Prison System in the Mission Hills and Lower Frenchtown area of, of Tallahassee. Um, if you look at the, the um, uh, uh, the long uh, avenue, about two blocks up from the bottom of this picture, that's, uh, that, that is, um, uh, my office is about two blocks from that. Uh, so on the other side of that line is the Mission Hills and Lower Frenchtown area. There are about 50 dots on there. You can count them. I think there are 40-some dots on there, on that, photo, on that photograph. That is one year's criminal justice reentry into that neighborhood of about 2,500 people. Um, so if you want to try to look and, and put yourself anywhere on that map, in the in, in the empty in the empty in, in two of those empty spaces, uh, there are school. They, uh, two of those empty spaces are schools. So you made yourself a kid anywhere on that map, and then tried to walk to the school. What you would see is that from almost anywhere in that neighborhood to walk to one of the schools in that neighborhood, you're going to walk by by a home where somebody came from the state prison system, state of Florida, to live in that home um, that year. But that's not the story. What I want you to do is look at that slide and take those dots and in your mind, double them. Because for every person released in 1990 uh, to 60 to the prison, another person was removed from this community uh, two years earlier. So that's the, that's the two-year story. But in, but in two years, you would have that thing doubled and then doubled again. So it would take those dots, sort of in, visually double them, visually double them again, and then visually double them again. And that is the experience of a kid who goes to high school living in that neighborhood from his freshman year in high school until his senior, graduating his senior year of high school, a quadrupling of the impact of incarceration on that neighborhood. Um, what you see when you visualize that is how ubiquitous this was. 
here, what we learned in this neighborhood, we interviewed about 65 people in this particular neighborhood, another 60 people in another neighborhood, maybe about 70 people in this neighborhood. And we, interviewed, we interviewed them, and one of the standard questions on our interview schedule was, has a member of your family been incarcerated in the state prison system within the last five years? Uh, the way we found the people to interview is that we walked door to door in some of the housing projects. We went to the churches and were introduced by the pastors and spoke to people after church on night. We sat in a restaurant. There's a sort of a diagonal street that goes through that area uh, where uh, there's a restaurant, uh, a well-known uh, African-American neighborhood restaurant. Yeah, there we sat in that restaurant for a few days, and anybody who came in, we obviously stood out like sore thumbs. We were whites in that neighborhood. We talked to them, um, and we spoke to the neighborhood, pres neighborhood association president and had that person introduce us to, to friends. So we used a wide array of ways of trying to find out who to talk to, and every single person we asked that question said yes. And not only that, but that included the current uh, president of the Urban League, a former mayor of the city of Tallahassee, and the, and the reverend of the AME Baptist Church that's located in that neighborhood. So st standing citizens, leading citizens in the neighborhood have family members who have been incarcerated the last five years. Every single person we talked to. Next slide, please. This is a ratios of residents to sentenced and jail and prison offenders in Brooklyn, New York. Um, uh, on the left-hand side is residents for the total population. On the right-hand side is residents for uh, is ratios for males, which you can't see is the number under there. But in the dark blue boxes, the two neighborhoods there, one person went to prison or jail from that neighborhood that year for every eight males aged 20 to 45. One per, that, I'm going to say that again. One person went to prison or jail for every eight males aged um, uh, uh, 20 to 45. And the entire thrust of the criminal justice system in New York is to try to get that up to one in seven if they possibly can, as though that somehow is going to make things better. You have to arrest more people and to send more people to prison or jail. Next slide. That's what I was hoping Could you review that for me again, Dr. Clear? I think I've I lost it. Yeah, sure. Bit. Sure. So this is a, these are two maps of Brooklyn. There are council districts in Brooklyn. Uh, the two council districts there that are the darkest blue, eight people went to prison or jail in that year from that block for every uh, uh, one resident. I'm sorry, uh, for, I'm sorry, one person went to prison or jail from that neighborhood in that year for every eight residents, every eight, for every eight males aged um, uh, 20 to 45. Okay. So more uh, than ten percent. More second. than ten percent. I'm sorry. I want to just interrupt us. Remind us to uh, use star six to mute the phone if you're able, or use your mute button. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Clear. Sure. He's in the. Um... Next, next slide, please. Slide, please. So this is prison and jail expenditure. This is a mind-blowing slide. The dark brown blocks here, and there are about a dozen of them. In the dark, this is a block by block map, map again of Brooklyn. In the dark brown blocks, more than a million dollars was spent in that year incarcerating residents of that block for that year. And in the highest incarceration block in Brooklyn, three and a, three and a half million dollars was being spent incarcerating residents of that block. So what this means is that there's enormous money being spent, and here's what it's being spent on. That, my, my sort of throwaway line, it's not entirely true, but it's true enough to make the point, is that this is a policy in which people who live on Park Avenue are giving money to people who live in Auburn, New York, to watch people who live in Brooklyn for two years and send them back works. It doesn't summarize the... Uh, so uh, I'm having trouble because I'm, he I'm hearing a lot of uh, yeah, background Once noise. again, let me, um, if I can ask the person who is uh, not muting the phone to press star six or to remain quiet in your cube, if you would. And uh, we'll go ahead, Dr. Clear. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So, and I wonder what you, if you uh, went to the block where $3.5 million is being spent, and you said, we have $3.5 million to make this block safer. Are we doing exactly what we ought to be doing with that money? If, if anyone would say yes, and of course they would say no. They would say, we got a lot of things we'd like to do with $3.5 million to make our block safer that, are not, that, that we can't get done because the money is being tied up in other ways. Next slide, please. So 
what uh, the last uh, two, ch the last chapter uh, of my book and the and a very long appendix describes it, uh, what I believe to be the solution to this problem, and that is the idea of community justice. Uh, let me just uh, summarize. This is a, a summary of what community justice means. It means addressing public safety priorities within the context of long-term community improvement. So these studies that I'm citing in here, showing that incarceration rates make communities worse, mean that justice is not being done in those communities. To make to do justice, uh, we have to increase the shared decision making between criminal justice professionals and community leaders. We have to coordinate across age criminal justices for multiple multi-agency responses to community priorities. We need to merge the criminal justice investments and community resources locally. Imagine if that three and a half million dollars in that block, some of that were available to use in that block locally to make that block a better place. And, and this is the most important, we need to look at offenders as untapped community assets, people who can contribute back to the community instead of just being both sent to prison and returned back as strains on the community. And that's the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clear. That's, um, that's a sobering presentation, if, if not excellent presentation. Um, why don't we take this time, and uh, there's, there's a couple more slides you have. I don't know if you want to go through these or not. Um, uh, let me, are there more slides? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It, you're right. I added a couple at the end. So maybe I, maybe I, reorg well, I might have reorganized no, them. No, yes. no, you didn't. I forgot I had put these on at the end. Thank you very much. So this is a picture of one of those neighborhoods in Brooklyn that had high incarceration rates where one person was going to prison or jail for every eight people, um, uh, of that, uh, eight males aged uh, 20 to 45. This shows a block-by-block -block criminal justice involvement rate, so the brown blocks have the highest rates. Uh, and what you can't see on here is those little boxes that have little letters on there that you can't read. Those are indigenous community organizations. They're engaged in local service delivery in, the criminal, in, uh, in those neighborhoods designed to make those neighborhoods better places. These are the, uh, these are, there's a couple of uh, church-related uh, programs in there, but it's mostly private, nonprofit, uh, voluntary groups, uh, child uh, uh, supervision groups, and so on. These are all potential partners for the criminal justice system to use to help make those neighborhoods safer. But right now in New York, the, the only relationship that the criminal justice system has in those neighborhoods with those organizations is to, uh, is, is to arrest people who might be working in relation to those organizations. But uh, when those organizations are seen as potential partners in producing better neighborhoods, the criminal justice system can become relevant to the, to the social capital of that neighborhood. And I think we have one more slide. Uh, that, that's probably the ah, next. That's the next slide. Okay. okay. That's it. All right. Thank um, you. Sorry, I forgot about that slide. No, that's okay. That, that's great. Um, and I think your summary slide before about the community justice is, is clearly a good launching point to have our discussion. So we'll, we'll take some time now. We, we have to the top of the hour to um, have a discussion with Dr. Clear. So if we have a question that someone wants to pose, um, unmute your phone by star six or star seven, and um, you may pose the question now if you wish. You can try to star six uh, to unmute your phone, and you, we can we can open the floor for questions at this time. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, I was wondering um, what uh, types of reforms to the criminal justice system might you suggest, and also it seems as if the the way you've presented this data might suggest that sentencing should vary depending on where the person is coming from. Um, taking into account the impact on that neighborhood and the incarceration rates in that neighborhood. But um, wouldn't that result in some people receiving uh, much more lenient sentencing for the same crime or even a worse crime? Um, well, so the first part of this was, was reforms in the criminal justice system. I think, I think the most important uh, uh, reform this, um, th this presentation suggests is to uh, try to uh, make some of the budget that is currently tied up in the prison, uh, in, the, in the prison revolving door system, the system of sending people to prison, releasing them, rearresting them, and sending them back again, to make some of those resources available uh, to um, indigenous organizations working in the high incarceration communities to, to work to make, to, especially in relation to children, to make those communities safer places. The second question I think is a very good one. Um, 
Um, I I don't think you need to have sentencing for one neighborhood and sentencing for another neighborhood. I think you can do that constitutionally. I wouldn't recommend it at all. But I would make available uh, as an option across the board for all uh, communities that community organizations can, can volunteer to, can uh, um, offer to work with people who have been convicted of crimes in that neighborhood right, can, uh, as a sentencing alternative for the courts and receive some of the money that would have been spent locking that person up to, in order to be able to support those services. The reason I say that is that um, it has the natural consequence of, con of, of increasing the investment in the high incarceration neighborhoods without much impact on the low incarceration neighborhoods. So for example, if there's a community organization offering to work with a, with a, um, um, a person from, uh, I'll just make it up, from uh, Park Avenue in New York who's committed a serious um, white collar crime, you know, the judge can take that into account in making a sentencing decision. But if there, uh, and and that the very existence of that community organization is not dependent on putting together a good plan to work with that guy. So if the judge says, I'm sorry, I'm going to send him to prison, it's tough, you know, the crime is too serious, then that organization doesn't fold. But in Brooklyn, where you've got literally um, hundreds of people from that neighborhood going in and out of prison a year, judges only have to be convinced that these neighborhood uh, groups have put together good reasonable alternatives to incarceration for these people in a handful of cases in order to be able to generate enough uh, uh, transfer of resources from the prison system to those neighborhood associations uh, to keep those neighborhood associations live, alive, and those neighborhood associations can benefit not just, not just out of the prison system, but a wide uh, range of people who are living in that neighborhood. Imagine, for example, that one of the programs was renovating housing and that a person who was convicted of a crime would work uh, uh, 48 hours a week helping to renovate uh, uh, substandard uh, property. And um, uh, of, that, of those 48 hours a week, the first 24 hours a week are free. The person is not paid. The second 24 hours a week, the person is paid, and some portion of that money goes in restitution to the community. So the person is, is able to earn enough money to be able to sustain his family in the community so he doesn't get uh, re uh, completely uh, delinked from his family, but he's also making restitution to the community through free labor and restitution to specific victims through a portion of the paycheck going back to those victims. And then imagine that the property that's renovated then gets sold at the cost of renovation in these neighborhoods so that instead of, uh, instead of the cost being 100%, the cost is about 50% for the renovation cost. So the people who live in those neighborhoods can upgrade their housing by buying renovated housing that would have ordinarily been vacant uh, at a reduced market price and then, and then make the third assumption that the person who is doing, who is doing that work, it is or her family, on uh, the fourth house that gets completed through that person's labor. You're building in incentives for that person to stay crime free. You're building in incentives for that person in the community. And, and, and you're creating stable community members. One of the things we know is that one of the best predictors of, um, safety, of, of secure communities is the proportion of homeowners. Homeowners stay in a community, they invest in a community, they keep the streets clean. So, so this would be a process where you would say, I'm going to use the people who broke the law as a way of changing the infrastructure of this community to try to create, make a community of more stable homeowners who are committed to the neighborhood life, including the people who broke the laws in the first place. Is that, is that a good, so I'm not thinking about sentencing uh, in, in terms of, hey, you come to this neighborhood, you can't get this sentence. But I'm thinking of sentencing in the way that neighborhood associations can begin to bid on uh, people who are being sentenced for crimes to say, we'd rather, rather than send that guy away, we'd rather work with that person in our own neighborhood and have the resources uh, made available to us to work with that person. Dr. Clear. Is that through a community yeah. court? Is that what community courts mean? Yes and no. Uh, the yes part is that community courts are very much tied to the local areas where those communities are, and, they, and, and the best ones work hard to uh, understand what, uh, what community members want, uh, to think about what those community members are wanting to do uh, when they design their programs, and so on. Uh, some, of the, some community courts uh, are not as closely aligned to the neighborhood's residents as, as possible. Is so that, that, so that the yes part of is that a special I'm jurisdiction? When I, when I hear the term community court and I see, for example, in my area, the West Palm Beach Courthouse, 
is there a community yes. court office in there, or is that something that's set up by the community specifically for this type of action? In other um, words, it is set up by the criminal justice. I know about the West Palm Beach one because I was I was in there when it was set up. Um, uh, the the West Palm Beach is set up by the criminal justice system okay. and designed to serve specifically people who are arrested as residents of that community or who okay. commit crimes in that community. So they do have so one. So jurisdiction is yeah, its jurisdiction is physically that community, yeah. but it is not operated by that community. It's operated. It has a strong that particular one has a strong uh, community board of community me members who are who are board members to to uh, uh, to make recommendations on on how it ought to act. The, the no part of the answer to your question is that none of the sort of financial packages that I just described, creating the kind of community infrastructure building uh, projects, are operated by community courts. Mm -hmm. Community courts handle individual defendants who go through the criminal justice system in those courts. Gotcha. And they handle them from a rehabilitation standpoint, by and large. Yeah. Gotcha. Dr. Clear. Yeah. Good day. I'm calling from Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank Very you. I'm, I'm a graduate student in vocational rehabilitation counseling, and I've been impacted by incarceration mm -hmm. myself. Uh, I am developing my thesis topic, and at this early stage I'm considering uh, self-perceived and real barriers faced by former offenders in transitioning back into society. Would you speak to uh, my belief that, that individuals that are computer illiterate, that cannot read, write, nor compute uh, effectively, are in fact disabled? even though they do not fit into any DSM category of that? Yeah, that's an interesting argument there. Um, one of the things we know from Bruce Western's research on, on populations behind bars is that um, uh, something like the risk of going to prison for uh, black men generally is one-third. The risk of going to, uh, 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 but one-half of African-American men who have in high school are behind bars on any given day. Mm -hmm. So not finishing high school is extremely predictive of, uh, of going to prison or jail. That said, um, um, uh, you know, I suppose you're making that argument as a way of trying to generate resources to support that group, but I'm all in favor of that. Um, but disability is often... Um, uh, you know, it's something that happens to a person beyond that person's control, typically. And yeah. um, people who are not complete computer liber literate often, often, you know, uh, got that way through their own actions. But yeah. I don't want to quibble with you. If it, if it gets you resources, uh, I, uh, good luck to you, you know. Thank you. Well, I, I'm looking forward to your email being posted because I'm in search of uh, many articles that logically support uh, inferentially, empirically, uh, that premise. Okay. Uh, do you think you would be able to help direct me in reference to that? Um, I might be able to, but I can certainly put you in touch with people who can. Okay, I appreciate that. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Clear. Uh, there's, a, there's a question posted on the, uh, on the post that says, um, and I guess this is about the Brooklyn maps, the one out of seven or that sort of one out of eight. Um, what is Dr. Clear's explanation of why law enforcement agencies would be targeting the areas he referenced, and maybe it's also Tallahassee. I'm not sure, but the question is, what are your explanation of why law enforcement would be targeting those areas? Um, I think um, I think the police are um, making arrests in places. Uh, first of all, drug policy is in nor is the is the you know 500 pound gorilla in the room here, and and uh, uh, and drug policy. Uh, Drug enforcement takes place in, in these neighborhoods at a much higher rate than it does anywhere else in the in the urban landscape, um, and uh, it is also the case that in these are neighborhoods that are that are uh, asking the police to get involved in the neighborhoods. I mean, they, the police aren't going in here without being asked. They're they're involved. The citizens want to be safer, and they and they want the police to help them become safer. So. Um, the irony is that the conversation in these neighborhoods goes something like this. Uh, uh, arrest the bad guys and get them out of our neighborhood, but leave my brother and uncle alone. And the police are not capable of leaving the brother and uncle alone, but they certainly are capable of arresting the, the, uh, the bad guys, the people who break the law. 
All right. Uh, we have time for some more questions if uh, someone else wants to speak up. Um, my name is Andy Vesicio. I'm with the Order of Malta National uh, Prison Ministry Committee. And I'm the guy from West Palm Beach, and I'm on one of their subcommittees for reentry and so forth. And, and I read your book. It was re recommended to me by Josh Horowitz, by the way, from the Pew Foundation. So ah, it's, it's a great book. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. I'm, on a recent, uh, I recently got into uh, visiting these, these prisons on a, on a personal basis, one-on-one -on -one with the inmates. And I've seen about 450 over the last three years in the attorney's room uh, for an hour or so apiece. And what strikes me, me is I went to the uh, to the sheriff's department. And I said, "Tell me what this place, uh, per year." And they said twenty thousand four hundred eighty-five dollars. And then I said to them, "What is your line item expense for rehabilitation?" And the answer I got was, "We don't have one." So I said to them, "Can you put together a list for me of items that you feel are appropriate for rehabilitation and tell me what that number is?" They came back to me with $69,000 for the whole year. So we spent 20500 a year to lock them up and 40 bucks right. a year to keep them out. And a lot of the things that you're talking about, and it was in your book and, and the mapping and so forth, it's all very interesting. But we have these people in our possession, and we spend almost nothing. I mean, the, 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 the free time in, in the state of Florida is something like 33%, which is up from 18% because they've cut out a lot of educational programs and so forth. So we have 33% free time in the jail, and we're spending 40 bucks a year to keep them out. Uh, how do we get through that barrier? Because when I brought it up at the meeting, the chairman cut me off and said she didn't want to discuss it. She was not bringing it up to the, uh, to the Palm Beach uh, Commission. <laughs> so, yeah, I, where do you go from I, there? I, I, I don't know the answer to your question about about where you go from there. Um, and I want to say that, um, uh, you know, what happens is the prisons and jails get first in line for resources. Uh, and everything else, uh, after they get, everything else gets their budgets after the, after the prison and jail system get their budgets. Todd? You know, and, and it's just, yeah. And, and uh, as a result, you know, um, you know the, the prisons and jail systems uh, are the big winners in the criminal justice game, financial game. Pat, this is Beth Arnovitz from Michigan. Hi, Beth. How are you? I'm good. How are you? What are you doing over I'm there? Doing, <laughs> I'm on sabbatical for a year in South Africa. Good for you. Uh, listen, we've been doing a lot of work in Michigan on reentry. You know, we've invested, and, and it's really been terrific. Um, but how do we take what you put together here, which goes to what the gentleman just asked, and put it together for policymakers in a way that's going to be persuasive? I mean, this was a great presentation. Your book's great. It, it really puts together everything we've known for about a million years, right? But right. How, how do we package it? Well, I think the thing to do is, I mean, I'm not a politician, you know that, uh, that um, uh, but I think the thing to do is to, to try to get politicians to see that these neighborhoods that are affected this way want to be able to take control over their problems, and they want to be able to um, uh, uh, develop the capacity to uh, generate resources in their, own, in their own places, and that the money being, that, they, that they see spent just locking people up and returning them back. In these neighborhoods, you know, where 18% where, uh, of the men are gone on any given day, right. but each day it's a different set of men, these neighborhoods know that it's not a winning, uh, a winning uh, solution. So what's happening is the politicians think, I'm, I'm doing what these neighborhoods want because, uh, because that's what they hear people say they want. And if they were in a position to, um, to listen, to neighborhood leaders talk about what they want, I think you, you get a, a different kind of a conversation. Yeah, it's a tough nut to crack. It's, uh, you know, it's difficult. They're not organized to represent their interests very well. Right. Dr. Okay, Glass.
Yes. Uh, this is Ken Stevens up in Maine. Uh, yes. Hi. How are you, Ken? I'm I'm the finest kind. Um, really appreciate your taking the time and the the overview of the inner city. I just wanted to speak a little into rural America. If I took your uh -huh. map uh, of Brooklyn, um, and of course Maine is 100 times bigger with uh, the same number of people, um, and we targeted exactly, we took it over our Safari grant, and I could match your numbers in rural America. And I just uh -huh. want to speak into that because we have other issues like transportation, uh, available services, the inability for people who are seeking help. And without that local, which you're pushing, which is awesome, the local involvement of grassroots people, service providers within the community, it doesn't work. And we're yeah. looking at ways to to in, in cop, in cop, in cop, bring those people to the table. Uh, right. Our major right. problem, as I assume it would be in Michigan, um, you know, is the fact that time and distance is so great a deterrent because services, available needed services and services aren't available everywhere. Uh, right. I really appreciate you taking the time and speaking into this because obviously whether it's inner city or whether it's uh, rural America, the problem is the same. Uh, we just maybe have our problems out behind the cow barn, um, and, uh, it, but they're still there. So I'm yeah, really I, uh, looking at any way to take these smaller agencies, these smaller social service groups, and bring them together, because without that community involvement, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and it's yeah, a, that's a, I think yeah, it's, it's and it's a little different. You know, the other end of Maine is, you know, better than six hours from here. And, you know, how do you help right. somebody that's uh, incarcerated uh, two hours south of here? That's seven hours away from their hometown. Right. So I, I, I really think, appreciate I think that's a great. It. But it's that it's grassroots, and, then, and the problem with those grassroots people is they don't have grant writers, and and they don't have uh, a voice, uh, and we need to fix that in order to make right. this effective. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, one thought that occurs to me real quick is that there, um, in many rural areas, there are Native American reservations that have. A right. higher rate of crime concentration, and, um, but also have kind of a centralized leadership, and that this might be a good way to um, integrate these things you're talking about with Brooklyn into uh, kind of a rural area. That's right. Yeah. Very yeah. true. Uh, Dr. Yeah, there are. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, I, I was wondering if you would have a comment on the recently passed. Second Chance Act. Your any any take on that? Yeah, you know I don't know the act very well because uh, it uh, it went through a lot of iterations and was passed um, passed while I was here, mm -hmm. so I, I wasn't I wasn't able to follow the debates all that well. But it needs to be um, funded. <laughs> <laughs> I want to the the idea that the idea that in America we are talking now about. Uh, a se second chance as a value is a, is a wonderful thing, and it's something that that we need to we need. I don't know. I'm not a, again. I'm not a politician, but we need to take advantage of this opportunity to start the conversation. But the thrust of my research and the thrust of my argument is that um, if if uh, people reentering from prison is seen as a problem, they don't get to prison unless we send them there. So um, if we don't like having 600,000 people come from prison to our neighborhoods each year, this, the easiest solution is to not send 600,000 people to prison this year. Um, you, can't get, you can't get into the reentry unless you go to prison in the first place. And, and on the average, people who leave prison don't leave prison better. And so we need to start focusing on, um, on these places that are cycling people through the prison system and through their own neighborhoods and trying to change the, the nature of those places. And we need to use the enormous resources that are, that are currently made available in the prison budget to try to reinvest in those communities. Well, Dr. Clear, you know, I just would like to comment on that and what the other gentleman just said about the Second Chance Act. At the top, at the very top, the federal government is involved at Second Chance. The Department of Labor has, has programs going on and so forth. But if they mm -hmm. fail to fund it, uh, it's tough to do much with it. Yeah. If you take it from the yeah. top all the way down again, 
third time to West Palm Beach level, where you tell a guy, listen, you're spending 20500 to lock him up. Why don't you spend more than $40 to keep him out, and they don't want to hear about it? I don't think I don't think the faith-based community and the volunteers and all those people that go to prisons from all the faiths each week are are really uh, the issue here. I think the issue is that that the bureaucracy, with all its conversation, does not at the end of the day make the resources available uh, to to change things. As I read the one in one hundred report from Pew. And I saw states like New York and Michigan and Texas and California. Those guys sat down and they talk, had a good conversation with themselves, and they did things differently, and the numbers show improvement. Uh, but down here in Florida, you've got um, you know some 19th century thinking yet. Uh, if you do the crime, you do the time, and nobody wants to know who shot John, and the funds are not available, and the people don't want to talk about it. So it's. I think I think that the I think that the faith-based organizations and the volunteers will respond with bells on, but we need the bureaucracy in your next book. If you point that out, <laughs> I need, we need the we need the bureaucracy to roll up their sleeves and get serious because without funding, uh, it, a lot of this becomes a mute point. Yeah. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna yeah, have to say I'm gonna say thank you to Dr. Clear at this time and to all our participants. Um, I, I also want to tell you the next slide I show will be our evaluation slide where you can link in and, and do a brief evaluation, which will certainly help our webinar series, and I encourage you to do that. Um, uh, thanks to Dr. Clear, and uh, he, he did take time from his sabbatical. He did take time in South Africa, and it took a long time to get this done, but uh, I, for one, am amazingly gratified that we were able to accomplish it. Um, I've been looking forward to this after reading the book and being so impressed with the, uh, the effort and the, and the message. So uh, thank you, Dr. Clear, very, very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you all for being. Thank you for participating in this. Thank you all. Bye, bye, Todd. Bye. All right. You thank you. Bye. Uh, the, uh, the link to the, um, to the evaluation. If you just link on that and do the evaluation, that would be great. I appreciate everybody that was with us today, and uh, we'll do it again on July 1st. We have another one scheduled July 1st, and I'll I'll tell you details on the reentry list serve uh, with that. Uh, thank you so much, and have a good day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.